Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode number 23 of the JD Outdoors podcast. Follow me on Instagram at JD underscore outdoors 1773. My guest today will be professional angler Bill McDonald. You can follow him on social media at BMAC Fishing. Today, we'll be talking about fishing a tube jig for smallmouth bass. How are you doing today? Man, I'm doing good. You guys doing all right? Yeah, doing great. Doing great. Uh, any day you get to talk about fishing is a, is a good day, or fishing in general is a good day. Well, then every day is a good day. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> so uh, to start off, can you give us a little background on your fishing career, how and when you started fishing? I've been fishing as long as I can remember. I mean, we grew up fishing. My, I was very fortunate. My parents, you know, wherever field and stream or outdoor life would write articles on, that's kind of where we took vacations to. Mm, okay. And then my parents, my aunts and uncles, we live in Indiana and there's some strip mines around and they leased property in a house that had three strip pits on it. So we grew up fishing and, you know, fishing and hunting is basically all I've ever done. You know, I worked construction so I could be outside and then the weather got bad. You know, we just took off work and went fishing or hunting. So it's there been good. Go. I'm no complaints. Perfect. Uh, and then uh, as for tournament fishing, when did you uh, get into tournaments? I was probably close to 30. I was working more on the hunting side of things. I was working with night and hail game calls mm, and okay. helped them to develop the first grunt calls that come out for deer hunting. Okay. So I was doing that. My brother was doing a fishing deal and I was traveling, doing shows with them on the hunting side. And I still fished and practiced with him all the time. And he kept telling me, he said, dude, you ain't gonna make no money on the hunting side. You got to do the fishing side. So I jumped out and just started fishing tournaments and been doing it, you know, for the last 30 years or so. So it's been good. Awesome. That's awesome. I see you got a deer on the back wall over there. That very oh, nice. I got, I got a bunch of them down here. Awesome. So. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to get a few guests on to talk about hunting as well. Just kind of, you know, diversify the, the podcast a little bit, but. Uh, it's the exact here. same. I mean, I'm telling you, I tell people all the time, hunting and fishing are identical. Yeah you know, deer, you know, I, and I trophy hunts what I do. So I hunt for big deer, but, yeah. but deer are creatures of the edge and bass are the exact same deal. Yeah. So, I mean, you can, there's so much simulation between the two. It's unbelievable. Yeah. And uh, like for a hunting example, I remember uh, my buddy's property that we've been hunting on the few uh, past few years, my stand is right on the edge of a row of pines going into some oak trees and it's just like like clockwork at, in the morning and at night they're walking in and they're walking out it's just oh, yeah. it's, it's and you can obviously pattern bass like that too which is pretty awesome but so uh from there this one's kind of a, a tricky question for some people especially for those who have been fishing as long as you have but what is your best bass fishing memory you know uh you know i've had fishing with my parents you know my dad uh his last fishing trip you know he's no longer with me now and i got i'm sitting here looking at a nine pounder he caught nine? at lake kissimmee with me on the last day that me and him fished together in florida wow so i mean that's good and my son my son traveled and fished tournaments with me for a couple of years out of high school and that was really a special time yeah. you know like i said he just he traveled and we had a ball yeah he got to fish with a lot of good guys and you know, almost went in the Detroit River tournament was probably, you know, a highlight. You know, I, I hated being the first loser to mix in that tournament, but yeah, you can't win them all. Exactly. Exactly. So um, you fished obviously all across the country and you've been fishing for a, a while now. So uh, this question is might be another difficult one to answer, but uh, where's your favorite place to fish? wherever they're biting the best now. <laughs> okay. All right. That's a fair answer. That's fair. But, answer. you know, your area up there, that New York area is phenomenal. I mean, I, I'm, I love catching small mouths. Yeah. So anytime I get a chance, I'll go do that. And then like I said, Friday, I'm headed to Florida. So, you know, I can go down there and I can put a big flipping stick in my hand and I can go punching. Uh, there's nothing like setting a hook with short line, hand to hand combat. Yeah. It's pretty special. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm hoping to experience that when I'm down there as well this year. And uh, it's, I've, you know, 
I've flipped quite a bit up north here, but just I, I, from everyone I've talked to, like down south, like in Florida, that is, it's a whole nother flipping game. Like you're, you just got to be flipping all day sometimes to get those bites. But yeah, only looking for five. Yeah, that's so, true. That's true. It's, we're just looking for five. So, <laughs> and uh, this one is kind of along the same realm here, but where is your dream place to fish if you haven't been someplace yet? You know, I, I would like to go out to the Delta. Okay. I haven't done that. And then on a far stretch deal, I want to go to Cuba. Mm, okay. You know, there's some phenomenal lakes in Cuba and uh, South Africa, both. Those are two places that at some point, you know, if I ever get an opportunity, I'd sure like to go try. Yeah, that's a unique answer. I have not gotten that before, like out of uh, the country. That's that's awesome. So, you know, Mexico's got some big ones and stuff, but like I said, Cuba and South Africa, it's phenomenal. Yeah, wow, that's awesome. I'll definitely have to do some research on that after this uh, podcast. I haven't really, I've heard of South Africa a little bit, but I haven't heard of anything about Cuba. Uh, when it comes to fishing but well, it's it's strong yeah awesome so kind of the uh meat and potatoes of the episode and i'm hoping that we can break it down in great detail for everyone and that is fishing a tube jig for smallmouth bass so for those who are viewing and don't know what a tube jig is here is what it looks like it is basically kind of a goby body with some tentacles on the bottom with an internally rigged uh head and Got a few different colors here, but these are kind of my mainstays. So, Bill, if you want to just break it down for us, what you do, uh, you know, from the rod, the reel to the line, the bait, the head, all that good stuff. I mean, fish with what you feel the most comfortable. You can catch them on a bait caster, but I do feel like a spinning rod and reel, you know, is the best best application for the most part. Summertime kind of varies a little bit, but okay. early spring, and we'll talk about your area up there. Yeah. I mean, I've had some phenomenal days up here, you know, some 25 to 30, above 30 pound days for the best five. And a lot of those are when ice is just first out. Mm -hmm. And I like the long line of tube. And, you know, people are like, well, what's long line in a tube, you know? So, yeah. so like, if I'm on Erie up there out of Buffalo, Mm -hmm. We'll get on them shoals out there. And some of those shoals might come up to, say, 20, 22, 23, depending on the level of the lake at time of year. Yeah. But, you know, I'll take and make a cast as far as I can cast it. And then I'll go with the wind. I'll let the wind drift the boat. Mm -hmm. And I'll let a bunch more line out. Because a lot of them shoals, if you're fishing vertical mm -hmm. or you idle them, you really don't see much structure at all. But if, if, if you get enough line out, and I'm talking it might be 50 yards of line out, yeah. and then click your bail, and then you'll fill, you know, at 3 h tube, with your line that long, it's it's dragging more flat on the bottom. Yeah. Where if you're up and down, your your bait's like this, and it'll bounce over. When it's long like that, it you'll feel a little different differences in there. Gotcha. And those fish will just load up on it. Yeah. And then... You know, for me, you got to play around and figure out where they're at. But a lot of times if I'm on top of a shoal and I'm catching three pounders, not that there's anything wrong with catching three pounders, but they just, if I'm not in a tournament situation, they just don't trip my trigger like a big one does. Yep. A lot of times I'll get off to the side of those shoals mm -hmm. and I might be out in 24, 25, 26 doing that. And then when you bow up on one, then I mean, a lot of times you're catching five, six, seven pounders yeah. and you, you'll get them in and they'll have mud on their bellies. Okay. And I mean, they're not in season, yeah. so it's all catch and release, but I mean, it's, it's phenomenal fishing yeah. when it's like that. And then if the wind blows, you know, you can go into harbors there and do your homework, you know, with your live scope or, or, or your side, side scans. And go in there and find those rock piles. There's tons of rock piles inside of those harbors. Mm -hmm. And I filmed a show with Midwest Outdoors. And it's the only day we had to film. And we, we put in a, the harbor there. And yeah. The break wall. The water was busting over the top of the break wall. And those guys oh. were like flipping out. And they're like, we're not going. I said, I ain't going out there. We're going to catch them right here. 
and, yeah. and we did we, we made a fantastic show and i mean they were five five and a half six pounders what time of year was that was that in spring like you were saying Same deal springtime springtime there yep yeah gotcha and if it gets real bad dude go down there you know go to lewiston put in down there yeah. fish the river and you know out to the mouth of lake ontario mm-hmm phenomenal phenomenal fishing and you can do the exact same thing down through there you know long line in that tube and just slow slow drag it i mean they're not aggressive at time of year and you want to fish slow you know i'll throw go ahead no you can go i'll be throwing you know usually around a seven foot medium rod Mm -hmm. and then you know i throw a lose 2000 custom pro spinning reel and then I'll throw usually 20 pound braid. I'll throw a SmackDown braid. Okay. Some guys like yellow, some guys like green. To me, it does not make a difference at all. Yellow's just so you can see it. Mm-hmm. And then take a little gold label leader line and throw it usually an eight, eight pound leader line just is good for me. And then keep your drag super loose. You know, don't get excited. Yeah. Set the hook. There's nothing in the world they're going to hang up on. Oh, yeah, for sure. So just take your time. Guys want to horse them in. That's where you screw up. Just take your time and, and, you know, and guys go eight pound line. I'm afraid, you know, I'll break off, do that. I landed a, I don't know what it was, a 52 inch muskie down there on eight pound fluorocarbon on a spinning rod on a tube. Wow. So, I mean, you you have no idea what you're going to catch. Yeah, that's for sure. And that one, I thought I was hung. And I mean, I'm literally, I'm pointing my rod at pulling, trying to break the line. All of a sudden it started pulling back. I'm like, I got something. I don't know what it is, but it's big. You know. How long did it take to land that big fish? I would say it took about 20, 20 minutes or so. And what was cool was it was a brand new reel and brand new rod from Lou's. It wasn't even on the market yet. <laughs> and we're filming. We already had the show shot. So we're just having fun. Yep. So I hooked that deal. I told guys to get the camera running. So we filmed all that and getting it in. You can hear the drag screaming on the reel and whatnot. And then we actually sent the footage to lose and they used it in national sales meetings. That's awesome. To talk about the, the new reel. So it's just one of them perfect storms that come together at a perfect time. So that's awesome. Yeah. I've, uh, I've only caught a few musky, never on a tube and never that big, but that's, that's something awesome. And that was on Erie. You said, that was actually in the Niagara River. Yeah, that's where I caught my uh, biggest muskie. We didn't measure it, sadly, but it was probably like 40-something. Oh, yeah. And, you know, I was throwing it, chucking an A-rig around, and it was my first day ever throwing the A-rig, and I catch one small and I'm like, that's the hardest hit I've ever felt in my life on, on a lure. And then so I'm chucking it, chucking it in between these docks, and I'm like, okay th- i think i got two on here because this one really hit it hard and then i <laughs> see it like dolphin kick out of the water and i'm like oh boy nope and so we we get it in the net and uh i was just mind just mind blown at how big of a muskie it was but uh yeah that's musky are definitely a cool creature and uh interesting if you're not in a tournament i will catch them i'll i, I will i won't complain about catching one yeah, in a tournament or no fun, cut your line, retie, get ready and go again. Yeah, you'll you'll, you'll yeah. save a lot of time by doing that. So, But um, then as summer turns into, you know, you might want to upsize that line just a little bit. Like I said, you can get by at the bait caster and, you know, snap that tube. Okay. You know, popping it up off the bottom. But here's the deal. Every fish you catch, that fish is telling you a story. Let the fish tell you how they want to bait and how they want to get caught. You know, we all go out there in our mindset, how we want to catch it. You know, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. And that's how we want to do it. And, you know, a lot of times you're working a tube, you're doing your deal and you're not getting bit. And your buddy in the back of the boat says something to you, you turn around, you're talking to him, you turn back around, you start to pull it and it loads up, there's one on there. You know, that fish just told you, you you're fishing it way too fast. Mm. So slow it down, you know, and, and a lot of times, you know, light bulb don't click on as quick. I'm not the sharpest knife in a drawer, but if you can figure out what, why, and when, and where you caught that fish mm-hmm. and really think about it, it's going to tell you how you want it, how it wants it. So yeah. the same deal. If it's yeah. summertime, you're out there, you know, 
if you cast out and it never hits the bottom, you know, you know they're hitting it on the fall. Yeah. Another times, you know, you got to pop it when you pop it up and they smoke it. You know, it's just paying attention to what the fish are telling you. That's that's the best advice I can give anybody on anything. Gotcha. And, and then uh, when it comes to the tube itself, you were saying three eighths. Is that your just standard? That's what you throw, or do you kind of vary it? Three eighths is ninety percent of the time that that's what I'll throw. Okay. Now a few years ago, Rapid Fishing Solutions. Yep. Mickey Grant, he's got a scented tube wrap. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a tube jig just like a regular tube jig but it's got a microfiber wrap on the inside of it yeah and put a lot of scent in there on that and it's amazing how many more fish or you know how many fish you won't miss because of that i'm gonna have to pick some of those up that's interesting so it's a it's a neat neat jig that he's got yeah. and we're making them in different sizes because a lot of time <clears throat> You know, Mark Zona and I do some stuff together and we've talked about just like drop shotting and whatnot. Yeah. You know, I, I'm real abnormal on drop shotting. I mean, the lightest weight I usually ever drop shot with will be three eighths. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times I'm a half or a three quarter ounce guy. Really? Okay. For drop shotting. Because, you know, you want the bait on the bottom. Yeah. And if I'm throwing a three quarter, by the end of the day, I probably got 15, 20, 30, 40, 50 more casts than you did by throwing at three eights and you want it on the bottom. Mm -hmm. uh, so why piddle around, you know, guys throwing an eighth or a quarter ounce. It's yeah. like, you're driving me nuts, dude. <clears throat> and then in a current situation up there, like you guys have, I mean, uh, there's nowhere up there that doesn't have current. Yeah. So a lot of times, you know, on a tube and especially on a drop shot deal and you can drop shot a tube as well. Yeah. When you're hung, don't get mad and just snap it off. So a lot of times when you're hung, just load that rod up about half loaded up where mm -hmm. that bait's just sitting there and it, it's in the current and it's doing its deal. And some of the biggest smallmouth I've caught's been that way while I'm hung. Yeah. And, yep. and I mean they will flat smoke it. Yeah, it's it's funny. You'll be you're getting all mad, thinking you're hunting, and you're I say something to my buddy, and then I'm like, you know, he's like, Jordan, your line's moving, and I'm like, oh, what? And I start reeling, and I'm like, oh, there's one, and yeah, it's definitely awesome when they hit it like that, or like uh, even uh, I've you know if I've jerk baiting for smallmouth or something, I I hit something in the water like a branch or something, and it just stops, and I'm like, oh, all right, got to go get it, and then all of a sudden it's just gone, like the lines taken off with a smallmouth that just demolished yep. it well go back to jerk bait there yeah i had a tournament here at home which we don't have small mouse here where i live at but right. practice day i mean i was catching them they were eating good you know i had my cadence down you know three jerks and i'd pause it and jerk it three times and they just load up on it mm -hmm. tournament day i go out to do the same thing i'm doing it nothing doing it nothing and i mean i'd fished an hour or two not a bite and Guy in the back started talking to me. I turned around. I don't know. Is it to me? It was a stupid question, whatever it was. But I'm sitting there, and I turn back around. I go to jerk it, and it just loads up. Yeah. And like I said, I'm not sharpest knife, and the drawer did not click. <clears throat> I go back doing my cadence like I was doing, still not getting bit. He said something else to me, and I stopped for a minute, and then then the light went on. I had a great tournament because then I slowed way down. Yeah. And. So like I said, just paying attention to what, you know, the fish are doing or what they're telling you to do and, and yeah. keep an open mind. Gotcha. That's definitely good advice. And uh, my one of my biggest issues is always slowing down when I'm fishing because, you know, I just always want to be going a thousand miles per hour. But, you know, obviously there's times when slowing down even that slightest bit, you know, whether it's an extra 10, 15 seconds on the jerk bait on the pause or something like that, up to 30 seconds, what have you, that little bit could make the difference between having an awful day or just a lights out day. Oh, definitely. Without a doubt. And like to just, just stay open-minded to it. Mm -hmm. and, and those conditions, you know, will change from day to day, no doubt, but they can change from hour to hour. So that's the other thing. Just keep, keep an open mind all the time. Mm -hmm. Don't be afraid to try something new. So. 
So something new for me that you mentioned earlier, stroke in a tube. And is there more like, I know you said summertime, but is it a water temp thing or is it more like just kind of their location time of year sort of thing? If you're going to stroke a tube for some smallies. A lot of times it's just trial and error, but it can be a water temperature, but basically it's just, um, say you go over them with your electronics, you see them, you know, they're there, you know, and you're, you're dragging your tube through them. No bites, no bites, no bites. Well, then you're doing an erratic jerk. And a lot of times that erratic, you know, jerking that jig or jerking yeah. that tube, it just basically just pisses them off Yeah. and they kill it then. Mm. So, I mean, it's just something to do there and, and there's tricks to that. Um, if you got access to a swimming pool is the best, best way to learn. And, okay. you know, tax purposes, you could probably write off as a lure test tank. There you just go. saying you might be able to get by with doing that deal instead of, you know, I didn't put a swimming pool in. I put a lure test tank in. Yeah, there you go. You can get the IRS to sign off on it, maybe. <laughs> but if you throw a tube out there, and just say, okay, seven foot rod, you let it go to the bottom. If you hold your rod straight in front of you and you jerk your rod straight up in the air, if you're in eight foot of water, that tube's probably gonna come out of the water. Yeah. Okay, that's to me is way, way too much jerking on it. Yeah. So like for myself personally, what I'll do is I'll make that cast, let that jig get to the bottom, wait till my line's got that big bow on it. And I'll stick my rod straight in the air and then you get your bow in it and just drop it and whop it straight back up over your head like that. Okay. And you don't feel much. And then let it go down do about maybe a half or one rotation on the reel and do it again. Do that in a swimming pool and you'll see that that tube's only jumping maybe a foot at a time. Okay. Instead of six or eight or 12 feet. Yeah. You know. So it's some little subtle things like that. Gotcha. And the hard part of it is, is catching up with your line quick enough. Yeah. And then getting the hook, you know, set on it. But, you know, that's where you want to be a line watcher. And in that situation, you know, yellow line will be a key, key element. So you can watch it. And then, like I said, put a leader on. Now, I, I'm weird on leaders. I'm a guy that'll throw a 20-foot leader is what I'll throw a lot of times. You know, if you tie a good knot, you don't have to worry about it casting in and out of your out of your reel. But I do that for a couple of reasons. And one is the water is really clear. Maybe they see it. Maybe they don't. But I'll start out with a 20 foot leader and then I can retie two or three times before I have to tie a whole new leader. Because when you retie that whole leader, it takes a while. Oh, yeah. So. You know, those, those are the little things that I like to do. But when you're popping that jig, like I said, not big drastic deals, mm -hmm. just little short hops. Gotcha. And, and like I said, try dragging them, you know, let them tell you how they want it. Yeah, it just depends on the day and everything you got to experience. The day, the hour. Yeah. One one hump can be different than any other. Mm, true. Very good point. You know. Very good point. Bayfly hatch. You guys, I'm sure you get to fish a mayfly hatch some up there. Yep. I call them slurpees. Anytime your mayflies are on top of water and you see that little slurp. Dude, that we had one at Lake uh, St. Clair a few years ago. And I wouldn't even cast till I seen it. And you'd see the little, and it just a little slurp. I mean, it looked like a little bluegill or something coming yep. up there. And I would cast and my bait would never hit the bottom. And, you know, you just kind of follow that little bite around. It was, it yeah, was that's awesome. crazy, crazy, stupid. So <laughs> that's cool. Uh, it, it's awesome when you get to pattern some fish and you can like, when you get them dialed into that exact, like what they're doing and all of that. And I'm nowhere near being good at it yet, but I've had a few days and I'm, you know, every year I'm gaining a few more of those days where I'm like, okay, I had them pretty dialed in today, exactly what they wanted, where they wanted it, all that stuff electronics 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 and, and i'm an old guy so it was hard for me to to do that you know mm -hmm. I, I mean i come from indiana if i was over about four or five six eyes deep on my rod i was too deep 
that was my depth finder. But I've learned, you know, I roomed with Mark Rose for a long time. And, you know, so I've spent a lot of hours in a boat with Mark and a lot of hours on the phone talking to him. And so I've learned. And now with the live scope that Garmin has, yeah, it is absolutely phenomenal. I've heard nothing but good things. I've, I've never been on a bo- uh, someone's boat that has it, but I know people who have it and they rave about it. So it's, I, I would love to look into getting it or uh, testing it out with someone on their boat for sure. Oh, it's worth it. Like this year at Sturgeon Bay, we had the uh, Tackle Warehouse Championship up there. Yep. So my day, I was in the day two series. It was my first day. So I pull up out there on a, on a ridge that I'm fishing. And under the MLF format rules, you can't make a cast till eight o'clock. Okay. So we put in and I run out there. Well, I get there and it's like seven minutes till. And I, I know in my mind where I've got waypoints from practice. I know where I want to start. Well, I get there and I got the trolling motor and I'm easing around trying to make sure. And I just look in front of me and there's like 10 fish in front of me. I'm like, bingo. So I just hit anchor lock right there. So I'm sitting there, you know, you got to watch your watch. You can't make a cast. So I'm getting my rods ready, all that. And my marshal, he finally counts me down, you know, five, four, three, two, one, lines in. So I make the first cast out there. Bait hits the bottom. I just pick up, and it's pulling down. So first cast, I catch one. I mean, I'm looking at them. I know they're there. Yeah. Uh, so that was a keeper fish. Second cast, I didn't catch – or second cast, I caught a short fish. Yep. Third cast, I didn't catch one. The fourth fish I caught was a keeper, and I think the fifth fish was a five and a half pounder. Wow! So it's like, and it's all because I could see them. Yeah. So I mean, it's is it expensive? Yeah, but it's also like I said, you can get dialed in really, really, really quick. It's, it's like being able to sight fish in in deep water. It is. That's it. You know, and I, I'm not good enough, but I can say those are bass. Yeah. You know, but I can tell a group of crappies from a group of bass without a doubt. But, mm-hmm. but then when you see something that's about three or four foot long, you're like, well, that's not a bass. <laughs> you know? Yeah, exactly. But it's a, it's a phenomenal way to fish without a doubt. Yeah, I've got to get better with my grass for sure this year. I spent a lot of time this year working on them, especially on Erie, trying to find spots and like fishing that sand early in the year, late in the year, and you're trying to find those rocks. And it, uh, it's definitely a lot of work to put in. But once you're staring at the screen for hour number two, you're really starting to get understand what, you know, the different rocks look like and all that good stuff. I mean, there's days we won't even make a cast yeah i mean literally you just sit in that seat all day long island and looking and marking mm. and then you know sometimes i'll stop and i'll make a cast and you know you get a bite and it's like okay i'm done get out of here yeah and then with the live scope because you know there's a grid system on our screens so the box is two foot tall and five foot long so you know if i get a fish that's half as long as the box is long and half as tall as the box is tall i know that's the jumbo so you know you can you can actually tell by some of that how big those fish are okay that's neat for sure i i cannot wait now to get my eyes on it because i you're one of the many people i've heard talk about it and it just sounds like such an amazing technology that everyone needs to have and it's a plug and play i mean you can tweak it you can do this and do that but basically it's a unit when you put it on your boat it's a plug and play. And then, you know, you can, you know, I keep my settings in manual now for depth and all, and I I just adjust it manually to the depth I want. But as far as the gain and all that, it's pretty well set spot on. You can tweak it here and there just a little bit, but for most part, just put it in and go fishing. Yeah. So I had a question that just popped back in my mind uh, when you're talking about stroking the tube and you talked about Mark Zona earlier. Will you ever bring a tube like this and fish for largemouth, whether it's stupid tube rigged or whatnot? Because I know I've seen an episode or two of Zona where he's uh, stroking them for largemouth. Oh, yeah. Oh, without a doubt. I mean, the stupid tube was actually my old partner's the one who 
who invented the stupid tube. Really? Okay, that's awesome. Gary McWilliams is the one who put the stupid tube together. Yeah. And if you go back, I'm going to go back some years now, uh, early 2000s, somewhere around in there. Terry was a Federation angler out of Indiana mm -hmm. and qualified for the Bassmaster Classic. Wow. And finished third in the Classic that year. Should have won it. And if you go back, I want to say it might have been, I think it was Lay Lake. It might have been Neely Henry, but he caught all them fish out by a, uh, there was a power plant there had a discharge deal. And he caught all them fish throwing that tube in that discharge area. Mm -hmm. And his stupid tube was what it was. Wow. Van Dam ended up winning the deal. And, but like I said, Terry's the one who made that stupid tube. He's the one who got it going, and we're all friends with Zona. Zona's actually from Indiana originally. Oh, okay. So we used to, I used to fish against Zona That's a cool. long time back. You know, we just filmed a show together for Strike King. I think it just aired last week. Oh, that's awesome. And, okay. uh, so we've, I've known Zona for a long time, but yeah, stupid two brig, you know, if you're in cover, it's a whole lot better than that open hook. Okay. Yeah. I, I'll have to play around with it a bit. Um, do you recommend going to a casting rod when you're doing that for the hook set uh, or just are you throwing that on spinning too? Whatever you feel the most comfortable yep. with. Okay. Harry throws it exclusively on a spinning rod. Mm. I throw it more on a bait caster. Gotcha. Just because I like, I, you know, if I got my choice, I'll put a bait caster in my hand. You know, now when I get to the Great Lakes up there, for the most part, Mm -hmm. I'll put the bait casters up and I'll just go spinning rod fishing. And yeah, that's something for sure that I've kind of learned this year is there's like a time and a place on the Great Lakes for casting rods, but a lot of the techniques are a lot better on spinning rods. Your sensitivity and your feel, I think, is just better on a spinning rod. Yeah, and I agree. I've got to the point that I'm 100% braid with, with a leader. Yeah. You know? One cost effectiveness, you know, mm -hmm. you put the braid on right now while it's off season. Yeah. You don't have to change it again until next year if you want to. You might be able to not change it for another year after that. So that's true. That's true. And uh yeah, I've I've I know some people who throw it on straight fluoro and they get obviously a lot of bites like I do, but I think I get hung up less when I'm throwing the braid because I think I can feel it a little bit better. Like if I'm getting a little, so I can pop it a little bit to try and get it over that rock versus like that floral, there's all that stretch. So like, I'm talking like fishing the Niagara river or something like yeah. that, the current. And then with the floral, you're getting that stretch a little bit. So you might not be sure if you're hung up on the rock versus you have almost that like straight contact with the braid where your sensitivity is so much higher. You think it'll open Canada this year? Oh boy, I really hope so. Um, w w my club holds tournaments on Erie, and usually we get quite a few Canadian anglers who come over. And that, so we had a, I think it was a 12 boat tournament this year, which would have been like 20 plus with the Canadians who come over. But yeah, I've got friends in Canada, and that we've all been talking about it. And I'm just not sure. I hope they do because on Erie and it's something special can canadian water with how clear it is over there on erie and on the niagara river it's just something else yeah because i mean we we fished out of sandusky bay this this summer and of course canada was closed and yeah. you know i swear those fish just went to the to the line there because we couldn't catch them for the most part and i think they just went over and said like you guys can't catch me over here so exactly and their boat ramps were closed down for quite a while, I believe, too. So they weren't able to get out for quite a bit in the summer, I think. And in St. Clair, same way. I mean, I love fishing St. Clair, but the best fishing in St. Clair, in my opinion, is in Canada. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you're just sunk there. You can't, you, if you can't go over there, you, you still catch them in the U.S. I mean, I'm not saying you can't, but just there's bigger and better fish, I think, live in Canada. Than, than doing the U.S. side. So. Yeah. I'm hoping that they open up. Uh, I thought I just heard something on the news about uh, city in Canada going into more of like a lockdown again or something. Well, that's not a good sign for us fishermen who want to fish Canadian waters this year, but hopefully, you know, we, we've got, it's 
January 12th right now, 13th. So we've got a few more months up here till we're ready anyway. So hopefully by then things get a lot better. And Because when, when's season actually open in Canada there? I want to say it's, I feel like it's the third week in June. Third Saturday in June. Yeah, third Saturday in June, yes. Yeah, okay. That's the same way it is in Ohio and, uh, you know, up through there and in Michigan, it's a third Okay. The third uh, Saturday, I think it is. So, yeah, because I, I believe from uh, a guide that I was with a while ago, he was telling me that they made it then because most obviously most of the spawning is done by then, and they don't they're not huge on the whole uh, catching spawning fish thing. But uh, you know, and the fishing does seem to be better on the Canadian side. So obviously that season being closed for that extra bit uh, does something for them. But uh, us U.S. anglers are a little too impatient, I think, to, to wait till then. I get it. I just always sucks for me because we're in tournaments and I can't run up there just for the heck of it. So Yeah, exactly. So um, when does your season officially start this year? Uh, our first tournament, our first day of official practice is February the 8th. Okay, and where's that at? So that'll be Lake Okeechobee. Okeechobee, awesome. So we had two days of practice. So we got the eighth and ninth, and then we'll have the day off on the tenth. Okay. And then the tournament will be eleventh, twelfth, thirteenth, and fourteenth. All right. So, and I am ready, ready to go. Yeah, that gonna be a big, uh, like you said earlier in the show, big flipping game. Should be. I mean, you catch them, you know, winding a worm, uh, thunder cricket. Okay. You know. I mean, I could go down there with three rods, probably take a flipping stick, you know, a cutter worm, and then a, a thunder cricket, you know, vibrating jig. Yeah. And I, I'd be good. You know, I might take, you know, a red-eyed shad as well, but those would be the baits that I'll have on. Yeah. Won't be any finesse fishing, promise you. Yeah. I've, I've been trying to do some research and everything on for when I go to Toho, just trying to get a, a feel for what I need and just about everything you said what is what I've been hearing. And uh, yeah especially the uh the red eye shads down there i've heard when you're sometimes when you can throw them in the grass and rip them out that that's sometimes yeah. just the deal chrome blue chrome black back chrome blue gold gold black you know on that would be good on a thunder cricket type deal you can take black and blue white green pumpkin that's all you need and then a cutter worm or speed worm type deal you know, June bug okay. or June bug, or you can go out on a limb and throw a June bug, <laughs> you know, maybe a red bud, but you know, that's yeah. it. You know, you throw that and take a Cinco and go fishing. Yeah. All right. For sure. I'll definitely try that out and I will let you know how I do. Um, and put man size line on. Man size line. All right. Yeah. None of the eerie yeah. stuff. No, like I said, 20. 20, 20, and then, you know, 50 maybe on the braid, yeah. throwing a vibrating jig, and then, yep. you know, maybe 65 on your punching rods. Yeah. So you're throwing braid for the uh, lipless and the vibrating jig? I will, you know. I I'll mix it up back and forwards. I mean, there's a time in grass, depending on where you're at and how pressured it is. I've had situations where I'll get twice as many bites. Mm -hmm. like flipping with fluoro yeah. like potomac river per se okay i get twice as many bites flipping with fluoro than i will with braid no oh, okay and you know at potomac if you catch a five pound fish you caught a big fish yeah so i feel comfortable flipping 20 or 25 and i've got some 30 pound fluoro too but you know so i feel comfortable flipping that but when you ease on back down there to florida <laughs> And you're flipping in that heavy grass, mm -hmm. you know, and a, an eight pound fish is not easy to get out. Yeah. And I can imagine. A 10 or a 12 is even harder. So, you know, I don't want to be stupid about it. Yeah, for sure. I'm, I'm going to have to probably beef up some of my gear before I go because I do not have uh, much stuff for dealing with heavy, heavy cover like that or big weights, really, anything like that. Yeah, because, I mean, it's nothing to throw a two-ounce weight. Yeah. You know, to get down through some of that matted stuff. Some of it you can get by with throwing, you know, an ounce or three-quarter. But I had a tournament down there. I got in a situation one time where I was throwing a three-eighths. It's just little 
cattail heads as like little clump cattail clumps basically okay. okay and i was flipping them with a three eighths no problem i can get down but i wasn't getting bit and it's practice and i hadn't retied in forever and i get hung up so i'm pulling i break off and it's like i didn't want to retie right then and so i reached down i grabbed a rod had a one ounce weight on it the next little clump i flipped to you know i didn't need a one ounce by no means but i mean this fish smoked it hmm. That's another time, like I said, paying attention to what the fish are telling you. I thought, well, that was kind of a fluke. I said, I'll throw it a little bit more. And I ended up getting like five bites real quick. Hmm. What was the speed of that fall was what they were reacting to. Yeah. Hmm. So they weren't liking the three eights, but when I put the ounce on, they were all over it. So you just got to play around. Yeah, that's, that's interesting because, you know, like for a lot of times for me up here, like I always start off too heavy and then I have to go lighter. But obviously flipping that heavy cover, you know, going heavier might be the deal. Sure. You know, same deal. Edges. Just remember. Okay. Edges, 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 you know. So if anything, it's different, you know, even like on a break up there on Erie, <clears throat> if you got a shoal that's perfectly straight yeah if it makes a little dog leg one way or another that's where the fish are going to be mm. anything that's a little bit different and unique is what what the key is going to be to make that happen gotcha i'll have to definitely do a little more research before i go and i uh, get all my gear dialed in and then as for the uh the bladed jig are you going to beef up your rod a little bit for that compared to what you would say fishing in grass up north here just same rod but just with braid same rod, just throw a 50 pound braid on it. I'll let you throw 20 pound fluoro. I mean, I, I've got four bladed rod jigs tied up in the boat right now. Yeah. And I got, you know, one that's got braid and I got three that's got fluoro on them. Mm, okay. And, you know, cause like I said, I, I, I do believe that the, the braid makes a different sound coming through the grass mm. than what the fluoro does. Gotcha. And on that part, I feel like when they're hitting it, they'll hit it that hard. If they bury up, I can usually get to them quick enough. I can I can dig them out if I need to. But, but you know, that's what you want to do. You want to kind of hang it up in that grass, and when you rip it out, make sure you got a hold of the rod. <laughs> <laughs> Same thing with the uh, the lipless crank as well, then, for that? Yep, exactly. Gotcha. And 50-pound uh, braid and then rod, same as you'd throw it normally? You want a pretty heavy rod. You want a pretty stiff okay. rod. Because, you know, I mean, I'll throw that on a 710 or a 711 heavy rod. Really? Okay. Because I want, you know, and I'll hold the rod up more. So when I'm winding it, if I hit that grass, I can just rip it real quick. And then if they pull down, then I can, I want to get them up and keep them coming. So. Gotcha. You're giving me a lot to think about before this trip. And I'm, I'm glad yeah. about it because it's uh, all stuff I need to take into consideration. Yeah, good hooks, good hooks, good round bend hooks. Yeah. You know, some guys like to triple grip hooks, you know, the ones that bend back in. Yeah. And I, I did them for a while. True, you get one on, you can usually count on landing that fish. Mm -hmm. But it was how many fish hit it that I didn't get hooked up on uh -huh. that made me decide I wanted to go back to the round bend hooks. And you keep pressure on them, you're going to land the, the majority of all them fish anyway. Some you're going to lose. It don't matter what you're throwing. You're still going to lose some. Yeah. And then, um, you know, I know that this is kind of a Florida thing, but, uh, you know, the, the bigger, not bigger top waters, but, you know, the prop bait top waters. Do you ever mess around with those uh, while you're down there? Or A little bit. I mean, it's good. To me, it's a good practice bait. Mm -hmm. You can see if you can get something to blow up on it. Gotcha. They'll, they'll show their self to it a little bit. Uh, there are times I, yeah, I'm not a big top water guy throwing it. I, I do. I got one tied on. There's one in the boat tied on right now. But if they'll show theirself, mm -hmm. that's good enough for me. Then I'll go back and try to catch that fish. Okay, that makes sense. That's a good practice. And then yeah. flipping wise, you know, always throwing an extra heavy hook. You know, I throw a Hayabusa FFP hook five aught and snail knot. Always a snail knot when you're flipping. Okay. Because when you on a snail, when you throw a snail knot, when you set the hook, that hook turns straight up. Mm -hmm. Those fish are always hooked in the top of the head. 
Okay. You know, I've run with it a few times, but I haven't uh, had much success on it. But I'll I'll give I'll take your word for it and use it while I'm down there. Yeah, I'll guarantee you, even up there, you know, casting and all in that grass or just pitching around. Yep. If you'll tie that snail on a straight shank hook, that bait will be in the top of that fish's head. Hmm. Your hookup ratio will go up tremendously. Will you do this now with uh, fluorocarbon and braid or? Yeah, it doesn't matter. Okay. It does not matter. If I'm at home here flipping bushes and whatnot, and I'm just throwing fluorocarbon. It's always straight shank hook, hmm. always with a snail knot. And then if I go to braid, it's a straight shank hook with with a snail snail knot. All right. Um, any luck flipping the tube while you were down there? Have you ever messed around uh, in Florida flipping the tube itself? Only on beds. That's the only time I'll throw it down there. Okay. Yeah, something, you know, the tube jigs, one of the first lures I really was ever introduced to, like artificial lures. So, you know, I've always fished them for small mouth, but like I'm starting to get in my head, like, because I know that people have fished them for large mouth for years as well. So I want to kind of get into that because I think it's something that not many large mouth have seen in a while or what, you know, so it's might be something that gets a few more bites re opposed to a regular creature bait or something. Well, they got big for a while. Guido made them pretty, pretty pretty big hmm. and then like everything everybody goes away from it yeah you know i throw a spinner bait a bunch yeah you know nobody throws a spinner bait anymore they're boring they ain't cool it's one of my yeah. favorite lures you know you got to throw a vibrating jig which you know i mean i made a lot of money last year on a vibrating jig yeah. so i got no complaints on it but i still love throwing a spinner bait yeah back you have to go back and watch that show zone and i did last week i will We's up in northern Michigan, all smallmouths, all spinnerbait fish. Wow. That's awesome. It, it was pretty good. And then uh, you actually just triggered my memory again about the tube. Uh, when you said drop shotting it, are you using the same size tube drop shotting it as you would when you're dragging it? Or are you going to upsize, downsize? I, I might go to, to a quarter, okay. you know, and, and put it on there in the middle. And, you know. And if the law allows it, put one on the bottom. Oh, okay. Double up. Yeah. Because a lot of times when you're drop shotting, they're hitting your weight. Yeah. So, you know, you might double up. You might catch one. You might catch two at a time. Yeah. And like when you're doing that, I've, I've actually talked talk to Mark Menendez about uh, doing this as well. He recommended it at uh, the one seminar I was at. And would you, would you say that when you're doing it, you might take it as a cue as if they're hitting the drop shot that maybe, you know, if you're fishing it long enough with the tube on the bottom and the drop shot that you'll just switch over to just the drop shot if they're hitting it good enough, or will you kind of just mess around with that? Yeah. I'll let the fish tell you. Yeah. I mean, if I throw it out there and I catch five on the bottom and don't catch anything on the drop shot, then I don't need that drop shot on there. Yeah. That's okay. another link that can break yeah so yeah. i'll go the other way good point but I, I, years ago throwing a carolina rig I, I went out with a guy down on lake fork and the guy was david vance and david was like the best on lake fork at the time mm -hmm. and i went down there just exclusively to learn how to throw a carolina ring and went down there and that morning he goes buy a whole bag of those egg weights right there yeah i said we're gonna go through that many he goes well just get them up tell you when we get out of here so he got a bag and i got a bag we go out there and he goes every time you miss a fish he said just wind it in let's look at your weight okay so we're fishing along there and i miss one he said wind it in so i wind it in and there's teeth marks on my way and he said cut it off throw it on the floor put a new one on okay so we did that every fish that i did not catch that day i had teeth marks on the way so long story short, I was, I was fishing for lunker lure back in. Brent Gentry owned lunker lure baits. Okay. I talked to Brent and we had, for a while, he don't have them anymore and nobody makes them anymore. But we actually had a Carolina weight that the line went through it, had a hook on it and a hoe deal. Mm -hmm. 
Really? It was a weight that you could Carolina rig. You hung up some with it, yeah. but you caught some extra fish with it too. That, that's another presentation I got. I want to mess around with quite a bit is the Carolina rig because I feel like up here I don't hear anyone throwing it, so that might be something that gets. Oh, me. you kill them up there on that deal. Yeah. And too, like you pull up on them shoals out there. Yeah. Take you, you know, throw floor, throw braid with a fluorocarbon leader, mm -hmm. and it'll take you. You'll go through a shoal so quick because you can throw a rig out, and let it hit the bottom, just slow wind it. Yeah. And you can tell instantly. You know, especially if you got a tungsten weight. Yeah. It's like, you know, that one's all smooth. Mm -hmm. Now that one's got pea gravel on it. Mm. Or that one there's got chunk rock. You know, you just feel it that quick and you know exactly what's down there. How heavy of a weight will you go when you're on like the Great Lakes throwing it? Ounce. Ounce? Wow. Okay. Just throw an ounce. Damn. Like right. I said, get it there quick. Yeah. Get more cast in. And leader wise, you know. 18 inches long enough leader for anything okay if you're in grass you might extend it a little bit but 18 inch leader is about perfect all right i'll have to definitely try that out as well um so i just had a few questions uh to kind of wrap up the show for you and then i have a listener question segment uh at the end here but the first question is what is your favorite snack on the water i really don't eat a lot uh yeah. either neutral grain bar for cashews okay you know something kind of give you a little boost i don't drink any pop yep. at all you know energy drinks are a killer mm -hmm. you know so water and then i'll make a roll up in the morning so i'll have usually a ham and cheese roll up that i'll make with a wrap and then i'll have a bag of cashews and i'll have a few nutri grains and maybe a protein bar yeah that's it that's the extent of the food in my boat i'm a boring guy yeah it's um I, i'm pretty boring when it comes to eating because i don't i don't ever i need to start forcing myself to eat and drink more on the water because like i know i can feel it at the end of the day when i'm hydrated versus when i'm not and uh i've had every sort of different snack on the boat no bananas lately because i uh you know i've oh, I, no bananas. I experimented with it and you know we we accidentally brought them a few times and we were like, all right, we didn't catch anything. Let's bring them one more time just to see if it holds. And we didn't catch anything. So I was just, all right, I'm done with it. You know, it, it held true. So I'll drink on the boat. Now I drink. I drink about 12 or 14 bottles of water a day. Wow. Okay. So I do drink. I mean, I stay very, very, very hydrated. Gotcha. Yeah, that's something that I need to get better at. And I think everyone can get better at for sure on the water because we kind of take it for granted i think that we are fishing but it is a sport and it does take a lot out of you to do and you know oh definitely especially on gatorade is it's like a gatorade you know um gatorade's all sugar yeah you know if you got to have a gatorade drink half of it mm -hmm. you know don't drink it all at once i mean that's just it's just a ton of sugar it's just yeah it'll give you a boost to a certain degree but yeah like but i said they got some additives now you can put in your water, which is a whole lot better than the other way around. So. Yeah, exactly. All right. Um, so next question, which has to uh, kind of do with the same a little bit, but uh, do you have any tips for staying positive on the water? As you just said, obviously with hydration, but are there anything in particular that you uh, would point out? Yeah, just that next cast. Yeah. I mean, it's that next... I come from Indiana and I always make jokes. We got six fish in Indiana. We take turns catching. So, I mean, a lot of tournaments in Indiana, in Indiana, I mean, it could be a two or three fish day, two or three bites all yeah. day long. I mean, our fishing is terrible for the most part. So, I mean, I learned that you got to stay positive because that, you know, because it's going to happen usually that last half of the day when, Mentally, if you're not up, you know, you'll be asleep and when you get that bite. So you got to stay positively focused the whole time. And, you know, you got to believe that the next cast is going to be a fish. It's an addiction. Okay. So, I mean, you got to stay focused the whole way through. I mean, I, I've literally caught, you know, in the last cast, a six pounder and one big bass in a tournament, you know, pay 1100 bucks on the last cast. So, you know, 
Never I could have went in early. I didn't have another fish to even weigh in. Wow. So I'd fished all day without a bite, period. Wow. And it's like, I ain't going in early. You know, if you see me coming to the weigh-in early, I got them. You know, I, I know I got them. So I'm coming in a little bit early to give myself a cushion. So There you go. All right. So then uh, the listener question segment, the question we got today uh, from Facebook was, I would like to know about using my boat in the wintertime and if there's any way to get around winterizing it. Now, I believe whoever asked the question is from up north like me so i you can answer the question but i don't think there's many ways to get around it but keep it in a heated garage yeah that's all i, I mean that's too. the best thing and i mean you can get them before what was you that store, out there for a second before you store your boat fill your tanks as full as you can get them Okay, well, before that, you, your last time you're going out, you know, okay, this is my last weekend. And I'm sponsored by Lucas, so I'm going to plug their products, but I'm plugging it because it's the best product made. We broke everybody else's down. Yeah. But I would get some, some ethanol, Safeguard ethanol treatment by Lucas, put it in your tank, and run it in your boat that day. Okay. It's one ounce per five gallons. It's real simple math. Put it in there. If you put a little bit too much, that's okay too. Mm -hmm. Put it in there. And you know, guys will say, well, I filled it up. I put it in there while I stored it. Well, that's not doing anything but treating that tank. You want it to treat your lines, your mm -hmm. carburetors, mm -hmm. or your injectors, the whole thing. You want it through your engine. Gotcha. But then fill your tanks as full as you can. Because guys will say, well, I mean, I don't want to run all the gas I can out. Well, if you got a 25 gallon tank, it's empty. Okay. It gets hot, mm -hmm. then it gets cold. That creates condensation. The bigger area you got, the more condensation it's going to build in that tank. Mm -hmm. So the less room for condensation, the less condensation, the less moisture you can get in your gas. Gotcha. So, mm -hmm. You know, put that in there, put ethanol treatment in there, and then. Like I, said, I don't ever, I never winterize a boat, but I keep mine in my garage. You know, I still fish, you know, I out a few weeks ago and busted some ice and still fish, you know, drain it, make sure you drain it, drain it good. You know, I'll pull it out of the water and I'll actually lower the motor all the way down and actually start it and let it run for about 15, 20 seconds out of the water, try to blow all everything out of it. And while I'm wiping the boat down to clean it up, I'll let all the water drain out. Then I'll tilt it back up. And when you get about halfway up, you'll see all the water come out again, out of the cowling and all. So I'll let it sit there till it drains. Then I'll lower it back down and pull your plug. Make sure your pumps are all cleaned out and done. And take right. care of it. Yeah, that's pretty good. And answer. if it wasn't working when you put it up, it probably didn't fix itself sitting there. So your marinas are starving for work right now. So if you did have some issues, take them in right now and help those marinas out a little bit, get them some work and uh, just do your general maintenance on them. Gotcha. All right. Thank you for answering that. I appreciate it. Um, I'd like to also say thank you for being on the show today. You're a great guest. And uh, like, I think it was two years ago. Now I first came across you and uh um, more than two years ago now, but you were kind of the first face I ever saw in bass fishing on the cover of a magazine. So it's very, uh, I'm pretty honored to be able to have you on as a guest. So I appreciate it. And I appreciate you guys having me on there. And like I said, keep it up. And you guys have got a phenomenal fishery up there. Take care of that place. Will do. Will do for sure. All right. Uh, we'll keep in touch and uh, thank you again. Is there anyone that you'd like to shout out? I know you mentioned Lucas, but if there's anyone else that you'd like to uh, give a shout out to. Uh, you know, I mean, i got a ton of sponsors. We could go on all night. You know, Lucas and Lou, Strike King, you know, without a doubt, Garmin, Mercury, Bass Cat. I mean, there's a ton of Power Pole, Jack, or Bob's Jack Plates, Seaguar Line. I mean, they all, everybody keeps me going. You can go to Bill McDonald Fishing on my website. You can see everybody's listed on there. And, okay. You know, the only thing I ask anybody is give them a shot. You know, I don't take sponsors lightly their long-term partnerships this is my 20th year with strike king wow 
So I've been 12 years with Lucas and I mean, so I take it, you know, I take it personal when I get a sponsor. They're not a sponsor, they're a partner. Mm. All right. So they're supporting the industry, help support them. Will do, will do. Thank you again. And thank you to all the listeners uh, for tuning into this episode. Episode number 24 will be out shortly. And these episodes are brought to you, as always, by Wu Tunston, Tacticaleries, X Zone Lures, Rika Outdoors, and JD Outdoors Lure Co. Thanks for coming on the show. Appreciate you, man.